The topic of my uh, presentation today is the next generation of uh, ultra, tra ultra tall um, high rise buildings. Um, and I'd like to, at some point later in the presentation, to invite um, uh, Dr. Volker Abugarit from uh, BMT to, uh, to come and uh, take us through some of the wonderful CFD work that they've done for us. Um, so, uh, without any further ado, um, in the last 10 years, it's been a great privilege, uh, and it has been a privilege, to be involved in the design and construction of some of the tallest buildings in the world. Along the way, we've learnt a lot, um, we've had a lot of fun, and we've certainly learnt a lot of lessons. What I'd like to do this morning is to take you uh, through some of the more significant lessons that we've learnt on some of these projects, and then collect them together and uh, present to you uh, our vision for how we might then go forward to, to take those lessons to generate the next generation of uh, super tall buildings. Uh, the first of which, I guess, uh, any uh, presentation on uh, uh, super high buildings can't be, uh, uh, can't be without a, pre uh, a mention of the Burj Khalifa project, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, I'm not going to uh, take you through a, a full presentation on the, on the Burj Khalifa project, but I will just dwell on this slide for a moment. Uh, clearly this is the Burj in the middle here, uh, currently completed at, at 828 metres, the tallest building in the world. Your eye is drawn to this picture right here because the Burj is here. But in fact, um, one of the lessons we learnt uh, from this project is that uh, the value of the project is everything that you're not looking at right now. Uh, the developer, Ema actually uh, own all of this land here and developed all of those buildings. There's about 50 or 60 buildings there. And the mere presence of this building here increased the land value on all of those projects around there to such a significant extent that it paid for the building itself. So there's lesson number one, um, that what you're looking at here isn't actually the story. The story is everything else around it. It's the value add that these projects bring. Um, this is a little snapshot through the building. Uh, it's it's uh, arranged uh, in a way that's similar to all of the super tall buildings that are going on at the moment. Uh, long gone are the days that we just do an office building or just a residential building. This building has a, an Armani hotel, uh, service departments, uh, coming up into freehold apartments and then an office. And that mixed use sort of arrangement is, is very typical for all of the, the super tall buildings that are, that are going on around the place at the moment. I'll come back to this as a as a feature later on in the presentation. So here is the kind of wedding cake arrangement where, where the building is, is constructed in tiers. Um, what do we learn from this slide? This is a cross section of the building, a, a typical plan. What, what's uh, immediately obvious is the shape of the building. Uh, the shape is no accident. Uh, clearly there's, there's great benefit um, from the vortex shedding point of view that we can, we can step things to eliminate vortex shedding or mitigate it. But actually from a business case point of view, um, a triangular shape here provides about 50% more perimeter per square metre of floor space than a square or a circle. And if you're building a building that's 150 or 200 storeys high, you're selling view. And if you're selling view, you need perimeter. So there's another lesson that, that we, we can't forget in these projects. We are selling view, we do need perimeter. From a construction point of view, what did we learn? Um, we learnt that uh, reinforced concrete was an excellent material if uh, designed and detailed properly. Um, using current technologies uh, of these self-climbing jump form systems, we could deliver a floor every three or four days, something like that. Now is that important? Yes, it's very important. Um, if you uh, choose the wrong construction system and you're perhaps delivering floors every six days, then that's an extra, say, two days per floor. For a 100-storey building, that's an extra 200 days. For a 200-storey building, it's another year. Now, if you take the cost of the building times 6% construction finance for a year, it's a huge number. So the point of this is that, that the speed of construction of everything you're going to do in a typical day is absolutely critical. You've got to absolutely nail that. Speed of construction is... Uh, one of the, the, the holy grails, the quests that we as engineers on these projects have to achieve. Simple formwork we found in uh, nations where um, uh, you might say labour cost is modest compared to material cost in the subcontinent, in um, much of Asia, uh, across the Arab world. 
Um, simple formwork and, and hand place reinforcement actually beats uh, any other sort of automated system because uh, it is very cost effective uh, and very versatile. The use of high strength concrete, of course, um, on that particular project we, we used uh, an ATMPA concrete mix which is actually quite easy to produce. Um, moving up into the 100 MPA kind of range is more difficult. Um, the other thing, I guess the point of this slide, uh, this building up to 624 metres is reinforced concrete and we were delivering a floor every three days perhaps, four days. Um, the first 624 metres took about four and a half or five years to do, four and a half years. The last 150 metres took a year and a half because we switched to structural steel, as you can see here. Very complicated, slow. Um, building tall buildings at that height is about crane time and cranes are very sensitive to wind. So the downtime on the crane can be 30 or 40 percent of the life of the building at that point. Um, so choose your materials wisely. Another project uh, that we're learning some lessons on now is currently under construction. It's an 80-story office building in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Quite a conventional building on the outside. Uh, I guess a reinforced concrete core with uh, structural steel uh, floor beams and so on. But the really interesting thing about this project is that it's an all-office building. Probably one of the first um, uh, single-use buildings we've done for quite a while. Most of them tend to be multi-purpose. Multi and being an office building, what it means is that there's a lot of people in it. A lot of people means a lot of lifts. So if I can just roll back a slide here, you can see these central cores tend to be uh, completely consumed with uh, lots and lots of sets of lifts. What we did on this building was uh, uh, use a very novel uh, lift system where we've got express lifts to the mid-height here and then you transfer off into uh, to local shuttle lifts but each shaft has two separate lifts in it. It's a Thyssen Krupp system developed in Germany. There aren't many projects that use it in the world. I think this is probably the largest one. So if I could just run through it again, we take people up to the sky lobbies here, you transfer out and then there's, there's multiple lifts running in the same shaft. So that saves an enormous amount of space in the core. Um, like most modern buildings, this uh, sustainable uh, development is uh, paramount in the architect's and the owner's mind. And the energy management of the building is absolutely critical. How are we going to shade it? Are we going to use the shades for generating uh, electricity in some way? So, um, excuse me, I'll just roll back to that one. So I think there's another lesson there. Uh, in vertical transport is very, very important in these projects. You need to get that right if you're going to start doing a 200-story building. Um, which brings me on to the next project, which is one uh, currently under development here in China. Uh, it, it will be the tallest building in China. It's a, a, a 220 floors, uh, height above 800 metres. A mixed-use residence and commercial, mainly residential. And this one has, we've taken all of these lessons and rolled them into one and really designed this thing for speed of construction. Uh, the building, it's, the project is called the J220 project and the basis of design is a, a tapered uh, height uh, to minimise the response to wind and seismic events, uh, completely symmetric floors to minimise torsional effects and so on. We've adopted structural steel um, primarily because it can then be prefabricated, pre-engineered if you will. Uh, and delivered to site and erected very, very quickly. This is a comparison of the project here on the left, 220, 220 floors uh, against some of the other tall buildings you might recognise around the world. And uh, the current uh, development status of the project, uh, the design development is completed, the site investigation complete, the wind tunnel testing complete. Uh, the system's been constructed for real and tested uh, to 30 levels. Uh, and we're currently undergoing uh, full-scale model testing in various places around, around China. Now some key issues in design. This is a very interesting curve and probably one of the scariest curves that you can show uh, a high-rise building engineer. What it is, this is uh, construction cost across, uh, this is time, I'm sorry, across here. It's a 15-month period. And here is a construction cost index. This is the real construction cost that we were faced with uh, in the Gulf, in the Persian Gulf, where we were doing a lot of work in the last few years. What you can see um, over a 15-month period, uh, the construction costs were increasing at roughly 2% per month. 2% per month, something like that. So 
uh, the, the different curves are different parts. This is material, the green one is labour cost and so on. But essentially all kind of rolled up into one. We were faced with uh, trying to build super tall buildings where the cost was increasing at 2% a month. So we're talking north of 20% per annum. Uh, in that environment, speed is king. If you cannot design a building that can be built quickly, it's not going to be built. And the same thing's happening in parts of Asia. This is the construction cost index for Vietnam, where we know the rate of inflation there is very high. Some other lessons. I won't go through the um, things about wind and so on. These are pretty, pretty normal. I, I will pause on this one. Uh, climate change, I think it's a topic that seems to have slipped off the radar a bit uh, in recent years. And I think um, we as uh, tall building engineers and architects, we have a clear responsibility to consider this topic. Um, and when we're doing our wind tunnel testing, when we're doing our um, contemplation of, of the environment that our projects are going to live in, uh, the, the question I have for our wind tunnel folks is, um, should we really be taking uh, all the wind tunnel, all the, all the, uh, the, the measured uh, data at some airport or rather that's nearby, the, the data from 30 years ago, is that representative of the wind in this area for the next 30 years? And I don't know. I put a question mark against it, actually. Uh, we are living in a rapidly changing environment. And as, as engineers and architects, it is our responsibility to uh, contemplate um, uh, how the wind environment might change at the site that we're looking at. In order to do that, we've been using some of these, uh, these large uh, CFD models available uh, in Japan and from NASA and so on. Uh, to look at how the, the, the world's climate might change in various parts around the world and, and look at how 10-year return period wind speeds might be changing. long term settlements, of course, is a, is a very important topic for these uh, uh, tall buildings and uh, we've had the, the privilege of being able to measure many of these buildings. Um, I guess the lesson I can report there is that our, our colleagues, friends and colleagues in the geotechnical community are a long way off getting their science right. Um, I typically use a rule of thumb of two, a factor of two. If my geotech engineers tell me it's going to settle 100 millimetres, it probably moves about 50. Um, I don't know if anyone else has got that similar experience, but that's where they are. Um, do we ever go back and measure buildings? This is a question. We, thank you very much. We, we spend a lot of time debating how much damping is in a building, um, fiddling around with computer models and, and assessing the stiffness of a building. But do we ever go back and actually measure how stiff our projects are and what sort of damping they have? Um, well, I can uh, please to report to you today that we that we actually do. Um, this is some damping measurements, uh, stiffness and damping measurements we took on Burj Khalifa during construction. And basically, the way we did it uh, on that project, I think you can see here. There's a, there's a tower crane. There's always a tower crane on the top of these things. So you go out there at night so you don't scare anyone. Um, get the, the crane operator to put the boom right out um, and, and hang a block of concrete on the end of it um, and just, just basically bounce it up and down at, at what you think is the natural period of the building. Uh, and the building really gets going, let me tell you. Um, we've got accelerometers in the top of the building here and you measure the, the decay curve um, as it decays away over the last few minutes. And a fast Fourier transform from some clever graduate, of course, will give you the, what the natural periods of the building are. So we get the damping and the, and the natural frequency in that way. What do we do with that information? This curve here uh, is a plot of um, allowable accelerations, if you will, acceleration acceptance criteria versus frequency across here. Okay, The different colours here are different uh, codes, recommendations, guidelines and suggestions. Now, as a humble uh, engineer trying to work with these things and designing tall buildings, I look at that and my observation is actually We've got the basic physics figured out that uh, the perception of motion changes depending on frequency, but as to what the value of that should be, we actually have no idea. Really, have a look at it yourself. I mean, these are all the different codes and standards and suggestions. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of science needs to, to go into what the human body can actually tolerate yet, and particularly at these very long periods. With that in mind, uh, a, f a few folks uh, got together uh, uh, recently up in Canada uh, in a, a motion simulator. This is up in St. John's. This is the motion simulator here. Uh, and the motion simulator was buried inside a, an IMAX theatre. Um, I think there's a slide here. Right. Um, 
There's some of the, the world's uh, most famous tool building engineers here. On the, uh, my apologies, Bill Baker's here. I think Ron Klemanchek's over there. These are, and this might be Peter Irwin, I think, uh, all sitting inside this motion simulator. And the idea was that the, that the simulator was, uh, was moving around. It's being fed with information we have from the wooden tunnel as to, as to what sort of movements we're expecting. And as you look out the window, you saw the skyline of Chicago, and you could uh, then keep amping up the motion until people started feeling uncomfortable. So that was a very useful uh, exercise, I think, to try and understand uh, what the acceptance uh, criteria should be for these super tall buildings. OK, next generation. This is the final uh, 10 slides or so. What do we do with all of this uh, experience uh, uh, and uh, observations? Let's roll on to the, the next generation of high rise. For me, I think our next challenge is not materials, it's not uh, computers, it's not any of these things. Our next big challenge is actually the management of energy in these, in these buildings. The taller we go, the more energy these buildings consume, and by and large, as an industry, we haven't managed yet to, um, to mitigate the consumption of energy in these buildings. So let's have a look at what technologies are around. This is an interesting... Uh, project that was constructed in, uh, in Spain some time ago, 150 metre tower, 150 metre diameter uh, sort of circle of glass, if you will. Uh, the solar radiation came in, heated the air, the air runs up the tube, and, and basically through convection, it goes through a little turbine, which is great. It generates electricity, terrific. How much does it generate? It generates about, um, about 50 kilowatts. To run a 100 storey building, we need 20 megawatts, OK? Engineering is a numbers game. Engineering is a numbers game. To run a 100-storey building, we need 20 megawatts. So this is a fabulous idea, but it's not something we're going to use in my lifetime. What about wind? Let's look at the numbers, guys. We've got two or three megawatts available from these wind turbines that are 100 metres in diameter. So to run one 100-storey building, we need six or eight of these turbines. The numbers just don't stack up. I love wind, engine, wind power. I think it's fantastic. But for super tall buildings, the numbers just don't work for us. Let's go back a little. Let's rewind to about 2,000 years and see what they used to do. Maybe we can get a clue as to what, what was uh, happening in, the, in, in previous times. This is a, a slide uh, taken from an area where I live in the Persian Gulf. Uh, of, a, of a cooling tower, um, a wind tower they call it. Uh, the wind blows along here, it comes down and there's wet hessian and so on kind of hanging in here to cool. Uh, and they work, they work. Uh, there's a sort of natural kind of cycle going on. Uh, the folks sit down here in the evening and, and, and they actually do work. Maybe we can learn something here. Let's take that idea a little further. Uh, we do actually use these things, that sort of uh, uh, the dropping of air and the cooling of it in these cooling towers uh, for, for power stations. We spray, in fact, we take water and we spray water in the top. Uh, when the water's sprayed in the top, the air gets denser, about 5%, 5 to 7% denser, something like that, and it drops. It drops down and it cools and it rushes out the bottom. So there's a little bit of, um, a bit of activity happening there. Why don't we see if we can amp that up to capture the very essence of a tall building? And right at this point, I'm going to invite my co-presenter, uh, Dr. Volker. If he can come up from uh, the Managing Director of BMT F Fluid Dynamics to take you through some computational fluid dynamics that they've been doing for us on uh, 1,000 and 2,000 metre uh, tubes, buildings, if you will, to see how much energy we can actually get out of this thing. Green. OK. Thanks, Andy. Um yeah, uh, the last time the last time we looked at building envelope uh, <coughs> related energy generation was for building integrated turbines, and Andy's uh, on the uh, World Trade Center Bahrain project. And Andy's already talked about that. On that project, we were generating with quite large scale turbines, we we're generating about 10 percent of the energy need. This idea um, looks at the challenge slightly differently. Um, as Andy said, uh, fundamentally, you uh, you rely on dry at the top, uh, you saturate it with water. Um, <clears throat> the, the basic physics then works in a way that uh, the air starts, <clears throat> starts falling, dropping heavy air. Um, and as the, uh, the air then starts condensating, you end up with a jet of, uh, jet of air at the bottom. 
um, and which you can then convert using uh, using turbine. So we set up some some CFD models, which uh, which you see here, and we were able to um, <clears throat> we were able to recreate the uh, <clears throat> we were able to recreate the basic physics. Um, the CFD model was suggesting it works. Um, so we had we got the entrainment at the top. Uh, the air was dropping. The basic physics uh, we were able to simulate, and at the at the bottom you actually generate quite quite high velocities because you're necking down the airflow. Um, this was this was quite a large building uh, that we were looking at. It had a <clears throat> had a hundred meter uh, hundred meter core, um, <clears throat> which we, we we played tunes on it. We we went down to smaller core sizes, um, but we were getting velocities at the bottom, which which were in the regime that make you believe you can use fairly fairly conventional uh, turbine technology to convert it. Um, this is quite a key graph. This, this kind, of, kind of tells you what the driving parameters are, and if you are going to look at this, um, <clears throat> how, how you might, you know, the key things that you might want to think about uh, configuring. Um, here's, here's Andy's 20 megawatt line. Um, the, uh, we, looked at, we looked at different, different stack heights. The stack heights shown in this graph are quite tall. Um, but on the on the x-axis um, is is really you see the driving parameter um, having having uh, <coughs> low relative humidity uh, is really really what you're looking for you, you you're looking for dry air uh, and the whole the whole physics are driven on the on the difference in humidity because it tells you how much air uh, how much water the air can can be saturated by so as the humidity goes up the uh, you can see the power start dropping the available power start dropping off um, We've um, looked at we don't get different places in China, and this this uh, <coughs> this shows you how the uh, these curves here show you how the relative humidity and the uh, dry and wet bulb temperatures essentially essentially vary with location. So so uh, one of the parameters you, you you need to choose carefully is location. Uh, low re <coughs> low relative hu uh, humidity is, is is good. That's that's what you're looking for. That's when the when the tower might be working. What you're also looking for is to maximize the difference between dry bulb temperature, wet bulb temperature. Um, so if, if you have a location where this, this distance is large, uh, in principle, you have, a, you have a good chance of making that tower work. Um, this, is, um, <clears throat> uh, this, this graph summarized some of how, the, how some of the key parameters interact for a given location. Uh, this, this was uh, doing, some, doing some calculations for, for Beijing as a sample location. Um, and as you expect, as the as the tower goes up in height, uh, generally the the uh, the power goes up as well. Um, <clears throat> obviously, stack diameter is is uh, is a driving parameter as well. And Andy, I think at this point, I hand back to you. Indeed. Thanks, Volker. Uh, I guess the the takeaway message there is that uh, for a thousand meter building, we can probably generate about fifty percent of the power that it needs. Uh, uh, to run on a daily basis. For me, that's actually quite a significant contribution to the whole sustainability debate. So we're currently getting around 50%. That's the sort of number. Uh, we set the team's target as 100%. We haven't got there yet, but we're working on it. Um, so what does this mean by way of architecture, building? Our friends at Picard Chilton uh, in, in the US uh, have put together an architectural scheme which, which might uh, respond to this idea. Uh, so this is a 1,000 meter scheme you can see here. Uh, where the, the tower goes up to a thousand meters, the habitable space is on the, the side of it, as you can see. That's the, the configuration. We've got the, the lessons learned from the CMA tower and others. We have express lifts up the back, then coming across to these pods, we transfer into, uh, into a separate lift cars that are running all on top of one on top of the other. So multiple lift cars in these ones here. Um, We've set the building away from the central engine, if you will, the core, to allow the, the wind to blow through. Um, we've also, interestingly, this is not a wedding cake. You remember I, I said before, most of these high-rise buildings we do now, you, you've, at day one you've set that as a hotel, then a service apartment, then an office and so on. Once you start building it, seven years later, the, the market may have changed. In fact, it did in Dubai a lot. You can't change that. Whereas this sort of arrangement where you, this use here might be different to that use and in fact you might start building this use on day one and, and don't even build this pod for two or three, four years. Uh, actually suits the business case much better. 
So there it is. And this is some further confirmation studies that uh, uh, Volker and the, and the team did at BMT, uh, having a look at, at how this building might respond. Um, this is a particularly interesting one here, uh, setting the pods away from the central core, allowing the air to pass through the building, uh, mitigates the, thank you, mitigates the vortex shedding uh, substantially. So that's a good thing. So this building is really interesting on, on lots of layers, actually. It, it mirrors the business case. Uh, it generates half of what it consumes, uh, and it allows you to, to build it at, at different times. And also it's set up to, to mitigate the... Uh, uh, the known uh, uh, forces that we're getting from the from the wind flow. So that's a good thing. So uh, sustainable energy uh, by design, I guess we're calling this, rather than by band-aid, which is pretty well what we do at the moment. This is my last slide. Um, it's a very interesting slide, actually. What it is, it's a it's a sketch, a pen sketch of uh, the tallest buildings in the world in 1896. And uh, the one you can't see, actually, is this one here, the Eiffel Tower. But what you can see here, uh, this is a collection of the tallest 20 buildings on the planet uh, 100 years ago. And they were, there's some interesting observations here. The first observation is that all of the tallest buildings at that time uh, were d built for uh, powerful uh, corporations. And the corporations at that time were the ch was the church. So this is all, these are all to do with the church. Or for government, look at the pyramids. Um, I'm not sure the situation has changed very much in that time. Uh, we, we, that's one of the, the key reasons we still do these super tall buildings. Um, but in one move, this is a very interesting thing, in one move uh, we went from, uh, from doing buildings that were a, a couple of hundred feet to uh, the Eiffel Tower, which was uh, 300 metres. So basically uh, the, the height of the tallest building on the planet doubled. One single building, which is the Eiffel Tower, doubled what was previously on the planet. So, uh, you know, when people ask us, is it possible, you know, we've done Burj Khalifa, that's 160 floors, is it possible to do a 300 storey building? Uh, you know, is it possible to double the height? Uh, my response to that question is that actually we're a bit late with that question. Uh, Gustav Eiffel did it 100 years ago. Uh, in one single project, he doubled the height of what was the previous uh, tallest building on the planet. So the answer is yes, uh, it, it can be done, and in fact, it has been done already. Uh, so with that, Madam Chair, I'll, uh, I'll leave it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Andy.